Hello, I am Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Nihal Al-Hadi in Toronto. Welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, we are talking about ecosystem restoration efforts and how to ensure their success. So to do this, Nahal, I'm going to start with some sad numbers, but bear with me. I'm just trying to make a point, and the ending is fun and even cute. Can we not just skip straight to cute? I'm sorry, I can't do that. We need to, you know, set the scene, explain why this is important when we're talking about ecosystem interaction. So according to a 2019 UN report, 100 million hectares of tropical forest were lost from 1980 to 2000, primarily due to expansion of cattle ranches and agriculture. Of course, the loss of tropical forests isn't just about trees and plant life. These forests host biodiversity, and they're a whole ecosystem, and you're going to hear that word a lot this week. But in 20 years, a forest the size of Norway disappeared from the face of the earth. And we've lost more than 85% of wetlands that were present in the 1700s, and the list goes on. It's not so great. I'm sorry, Nahal. These are the sad part I was telling you about. It's hard to wrap my head around what that looks like. How do you lose forests the size of Norway? That's a really good question, because fundamental to this idea of ecosystem restoration is a question of scale. We're living in an era where there's a lot of effort and money being put into restoring natural places. But how in the world do you approach a problem that's the size of Norway, right? Like the scale is really important here. Well, As I've been learning from the scholars I've spoken to for this episode, one way to do this is to use what are called ecosystem engineers. Have you heard of this term, Nahal? No, I haven't. It sounds really science fiction future career. (laughs) It kind of is, although it's kind of simple when you hear it explained, and I'll do that right now. So broadly defined, an ecosystem engineer is a species that significantly modifies, maintains, and or creates habitats. And around the world, biologists and ecologists are turning to these species as a way to restore habitats at scale. So what kind of creatures are we talking about here? Well, I did promise we'd end up somewhere cute, and that's with the humble beaver. You know, can I say as a Canadian, I don't find them that cute? (laughs) I live by a river, and there's a family of beavers, and they're total punks. They like, they take trees. They leave baby tree stumps everywhere. Okay, okay. Punks. <laughs> I would call them cute punks, but point taken to haul. But beavers are a classic example of an animal that dramatically alters habitats. And some people like Josh Larson are using them to restore river systems to their former glory. Most of the people in Britain and most of their ancestors have never known beavers. So their reintroduction is a very recent phenomenon. Josh is an associate professor of water science at the University of Birmingham in the UK. He's written a couple of articles for the conversation about his recent efforts to reintroduce Eurasian beavers to Britain, a place where they've been extinct for more than 500 years. It all began in Scotland. There was a a reintroduction of some beavers onto an estate in Scotland. They expanded into another part of Scotland after that. And once they had this kind of foothold, People said, well, can we apply for a license too? Can we have some beavers? And then after that, you know, the government started having a process to apply for these reintroduction licenses. And they said, yes, but you've got to have these enclosures in most of the cases. And at the moment, it's possible to relocate them from, you know, areas where they are problematic and and take them to areas, you know, where they're desired in many cases. So why would beavers be considered desirable? Beavers are... You know, they're a rodent, but they are just a truly extraordinary rodent. You know, if you don't have beavers, you're not going to have still water very easily. So unless you build a structure like your own weir or so, there's no way that water is just going to be ponding. And if you're not ponding that water, then you're not creating all the habitats and, you know, ecosystems that go along with slowly flowing or still water. Beavers create a mix of that. So they do allow lots of flowing water as well between dams and, you know, far downstream of dams. Once the beavers are there, it just draws in a totally different kind of wetland ecosystem, if you like, compared to what the river would provide or what the river would have. When they do have a dam, they create this pocket of, you know, still water, basically, that's ponded behind that dam. And that is a landscape now that allows aquatic vegetation to start to colonise that wouldn't otherwise be there. And then after that, that undergoes its own kind of succession, if you like. It undergoes its own evolution over time. 
So it starts to fill up with sediment a bit, it starts to get grasses, it starts to get willows, and the beavers will gnaw a lot of vegetation that's there, but if there's no lots of trees present, when they flood that valley, or whatever portion of the valley they're flooding, then eventually those trees will die as well. So what happens in a place with beavers as opposed to without beavers is that you get a much more open canopy as well. You get a lot more light coming in, you get very little canopy vegetation, and you get a lot of pioneer species, vegetation species in there. There's these wetland ecosystems coming in as well. There's the changes in the fish assemblages in the river part as well. There's the changes in the invertebrate part, so that whole sort of trophic ecosystem of the aquatic part changes as well. The increased light due to lack of trees and many changes to the animal and plant life in and around a beaver pond are easy to see. But beavers bring about many unseen changes to river systems too. There are, as you say, some happy coincidences for humans in that they're cleaning up some of our messes. In terms of we have some pollutants uh, as a result of like agriculture, for example, but they could also be because we've got point sources from uh, sewage going to rivers. So we have too much nitrogen in many cases. We have too much phosphorus in some cases. And it certainly looks like beavers in some cases do help. So they do help reduce nitrogen loads in those river systems because they're creating that still water environment that I mentioned. When that water's still, then you get a lot of biogeochemical pathways. That's a big word, but it just means, you know, a lot of places where reactions happen between microbes, organic matter, and other nutrients. We get a lot of these pathways occurring in the absence of oxygen. And when they don't have the oxygen, they're using things like nitrate, which is pollutant. They're using that, and as they use that, they turn that nitrate, which is dissolved in the water, into a nitrogen gas, which goes back to the atmosphere. So it becomes a net loss to that system and goes back to the atmosphere. So that's a removal of that nitrate, if you like. Which is why we also want wetland restoration as well, because they do create or facilitate these water quality benefits associated with them. They also trap a lot of sediment and they trap a lot of carbon. They trap carbon for a couple of reasons. They trap it because you know, it could be organic matter flowing in that gets trapped and stays there. And the other reason is that they create these you know, still habitats and wetlands with lots of emergent aquatic vegetation, lots of seasonal terrestrial vegetation. As that seasonally grows and decays, it decays in that wetland in situ. So it stays right there. And then the next generation grows on top of that. And the next generation grows on top of that. So you kind of get this continual burial of carbon in that system. He says that beaver ponds can also act as important sources of water during drought. Especially during uh, low flow conditions or extreme conditions like droughts. Beavers, you know, because they've pondered that system, they're storing water in that pond behind the dam, but they've also stored a lot of water potentially in the subsurface, you know, surrounding that pond. So that river valley subsurface, all these sediments that have been deposited over thousands of years, is now storing much more water than it did prior to that beaver occupation. And all that water storage is now available during this time of, you know, drought, for example, and can sustain that pond locally during a drought period. and we had a very serious drought this last year in fact and you know you could really see the impact visually of river systems associated with beaver ponds where they had those dams they were able to sustain you know some water some habitat there which is just critical for as a refuge for the aquatic species but also the terrestrial species as well and one of the best parts about reintroducing beavers to an area is that once you get past the time and money it costs to initially relocate a couple beavers they work for free if you think about other ways you could restore nature you know you could plant trees you could do all sorts of things all of that requires lots of labor from humans and as a result that takes a lot of cost in terms of direct money cost or time cost or whatever it is Beavers are doing this for free, you know. So they're doing this engineering of the landscape from our perspective for free. More importantly, they're doing the maintenance for free. So humans can easily go into this landscape and we could build down, you know, we could put a few logs in, we can, you know, bang a few things in and everything. It's the maintenance that's the killer. So you got to go back, you know, every month, every week, whatever it is, and clean, you know, do all the things that you need to do if it starts to leak. It becomes a never-ending spiral of, you know, time and money. 
whereas beavers are just doing that for free. At this point, the reintroduction of Eurasian beavers into Britain is still actively managed. This means that biologists and restorationists are tracking the beaver population. They know exactly how many there are in the wild, and they know where they are specifically. And this is because when they bring a beaver to a new place, they actually release it in a fenced-in area to prevent it from wandering off and getting into that creek over there when you meant it to be in this one over here. Josh believes that showing the success of this managed reintroduction of beavers is a really important first step towards gaining support for a wild restoration project across Britain more generally. Beavers are the second fastest expanding mammal species at the moment, or the Eurasian beaver. Oh, wow. So they're in this you know, rapid expansion phase at the moment. When there is the right landscape, you know, we've said, you know, this place, we don't want to do anything else with it. We're just happy to let the beavers come in and restore whatever ecosystem they are happy to come up with. And whatever ecosystem wishes to return to that landscape that is there. That is, you know, just perfect. And there's going to be a lot of places like that. Then there'll be a lot of places in between where we're not quite sure and we'll be umming and ahhing about it and we'll have to think about it. And there'll be some cases where we say, no, you know, we're just not willing to do that. And if they come here, we're going to relocate them and put them somewhere else. But we do have to accept that they're not always going to be doing everything that we want all the time. And I think on the scientific side as well, we have a lot to do to catch up because, you know, there is this desire to rewild and restore nature to landscapes. And that's wonderful. It's just that our understanding of how that functions in terms of processes and dynamics is so far behind the desire to have them. So, you know, as people put beavers back and as beavers expand themselves, we're kind of playing catch up a bit scientifically to try and figure out how, how the hell these things are working and operating uh, and how they function as they go. Still, despite all of the incredible things these fascinating creatures can do and do do for a landscape, he's careful not to oversell the beaver's capabilities. You know, they will create new landscapes that you know, we haven't seen for a while uh, and probably haven't seen at all. I think we should also be careful not to overstate in many cases that they're not going to solve all our problems. You know, they're not going to solve climate change. They're not going to solve, you know, flooding and things like that. If we could be moderate with our uh, in terms of overstating the benefits, but really extol the benefits where they exist, which they do, then I think it's going to be a wonderful good news story. So all the pieces are there on the board for that to happen in many cases. And they can work in tandem with other nature recovery programs that we may be having. So those beavers that I was talking about, I've actually seen their dam grow as I walk past where they've built it. It's really interesting to think about the role that those dams play in ecosystem engineering. And the dams are what we think about as kids and stuff, but it's about the ponds, right? Like, I'm sure you see this pond growing behind the dam and the reeds and the fishes and the birds. Do you see that stuff, Nahal? I don't know about the fishes, but I definitely see the birds and I do see the pond getting bigger each summer. And it's hard to imagine this at scale, right? When we're talking about in the UK, what were hundreds of thousands of beavers and then there were zero. And that's hundreds of thousands of these ponds, these ecosystems that were covering the landscape down to zero. So that's what beavers can do. Is there any other animal that does the same thing? Beavers are truly special creatures and that one individual can really dramatically change an ecosystem, but they are not the only ecosystem engineers that have been wiped out in such a dramatic fashion. So to meet the next ecosystem engineer, we're going to head quite a ways south of the UK. My name's Dominic McAfee. I work at the University of Adelaide in South Australia, where I'm a marine ecologist, particularly focusing on the restoration of our lost shellfish reefs, reefs formed by oysters. Dominic wasn't always an oyster evangelist, as he now refers to himself. In fact, he didn't really give them much thought until a little over 10 years ago. This was in 2011. I picked up a paper describing the global loss of oyster reefs. And I saw around Australia in particular, because I live here, it caught my attention that our reefs are considered functionally extinct, that we had lost over 99% of them. And that just didn't compute because when you grow up, particularly on the East Australian coast, oysters are everywhere. They're encrusting rocks and mangroves and forming a veneer around our estuaries. 
What I wasn't aware of is that that's actually just a tiny component of what these ecosystems used to be. They used to form substantial reefs. They were the primary marine habitat in coastal bays and, and estuaries over about 7,000 kilometres of Australian coastline. And they're all gone. All those reefs were scraped from the seafloor over the last 200 years. And one of the reasons why we've forgotten about these reefs is that there was a fire in 1890s in the state archives in New South Wales where all the fisheries maps were kept. So that was devastating. It's uh, painful to think about that event happening. But in any case, we've lost that historical memory and there are very few maps left. But the ones that we do have show that they were extracted from all our bays and estuaries. And there's also a lot of documentation about how people were going to move oyster shells across the state as well in gargantuan volumes. And I should mention that Indigenous populations had been harvesting and sustainably managing oyster reefs. Certainly in Queensland, we have evidence for that, mm -hmm. but in other parts of Australia too. But within decades of the Europeans arriving, it was a very weird landscape. The European crops weren't doing very well, and the oysters were just there in abundance in the intertidal. So they were harvested almost immediately and really sort of provided the early foundations for colonial sustenance, but also provided a really valuable building material. If you burn oyster shell, you can manufacture what's called quick lime. So many of the early colonial buildings were being laid down with oyster cement. So that just oh, exacerbated wow. the loss. At first, you might not think that losing oysters is that big of a deal. They're just little shelled creatures. They basically don't have a brain. They just stick to rocks and the larvae are so small that you can barely see them without a microscope. But oysters are in fact ecosystem engineers, that idea we talked about earlier. When their populations are healthy, they completely change the coastal marine environment by quite literally acting as the foundation for the ecosystem there. One of the incredible things about oysters, they can thrive in the intertidal. So right up to the high tide mark, you have these intertidal oyster reefs, but then right down to 40 meters as well. Oh, wow. And an individual oyster needs to be prepared for that diversity of environments that it may settle in. And there's different types of ecosystem engineering, but the one we're talking about is uh, where they're forming an ecosystem through the structures that they introduce. So think of trees in a forest. Without those trees, you don't have all those secondary foundation species, the mosses and the plants, the understory. Uh, so oysters provide that similar role in the sea. So they provide the hard structure, much like coral provides the foundations for thriving mm. coral reefs. And we had these reefs formed by oysters stretching from about where the coral end in the subtropics. They would stretch all the way down in many places, right up to polar waters in the northern hemisphere. Mm. And the healthy oyster reefs that I've seen, they're really thriving metropolis of, of invertebrates, fish, crabs, squid, all sorts of organisms that congregate and live in amongst the oyster shells. So when oysters come together, they form this complex three-dimensional habitat. They grow up from the sea floor. And the reefs in Australia were sort of up to four metres high. That's a big reef and up to kilometres long. So individual reefs could be tens of square kilometers oh, wow. in scale. They were bloody enormous. So it's complex, three-dimensional habitat, which in the intertidal provides a thermal refuge, for example. It provides microclimates that are about 10 degrees cooler than outside of the oyster habitat. That is the difference between life and death for a lot of intertidal animals. Oysters are also filter feeders, meaning that they eat by pushing water through their bodies and filtering out and consuming little organisms and other tiny particles that are in the water. One oyster can filter something like 100 to 200 liters of water a day, a mature one. So once you multiply that by the potentially billions of oysters that make up a healthy reef, you've all of a sudden got what I like to refer to as the kidneys of our coastline, where the efficient water filtration systems that reduces turbidity, increases sunlight penetration, which encourages primary productivity, seagrass kelp to grow on the seafloor. What else do these oyster reefs do for the coastal ecosystems? Well, that structure and that filtration function, ensuring healthy waters, had a lot of downstream 
impacts. And one of the major ones that we value as, as people who enjoy seafood and thriving marine communities is fish productivity. More oyster reefs equates to more fish because it's fish breeding habitat, really good nursery habitat, and a lot of juvenile fish find refuge in amongst the oysters. So they provide a predation refuge where predation is a big problem in the intertidal. It's more about that heat stress refuge. They also, when the near shore, provide a buffer for wave energy. So a major motivation for restoring them, particularly on the east coast of Australia and the east coast of the US, where you have these historically thriving intertidal oyster reefs, would be to um, mitigate storm surges and provide a buffer to vegetation to recover on the leeward of those reefs. So those are some of the major motivations for bringing them back. Fish productivity, water quality, shoreline protection, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just thriving biodiversity in general. So uh, walk me through this. What does it actually look like to try and rebuild an oyster reef? Mm. Because we scraped every single oyster from the seafloor, including dead oysters, to burn, that transitioned these ecosystems from a shell-bottomed, hard-bottom ecosystem that oysters need to settle on to start to regenerate to a sandy one with restless sediments shifting back and forth. So oysters can't settle and start to recover. That's why they never recovered naturally. Oh. So the first step to restore them is to provide those hard foundations. And we've been doing that at uh, about seven to eight metres depth in South Australia by deploying limestone boulders, limestones made of a similar material to oyster shell. And oysters as a little larvae, can actually smell another oyster shell. So limestone is an appropriate uh, substrate to use. We build those oyster reefs, and then we hope that the oyster larvae can find them. And we hope and pray that there are actually larvae still out there in the system. We hope that those individual oysters are producing enough babies to naturally see the recovery. But we really didn't know if that was going to work. So, you know, the thinking was put some boulders down here, some limestone boulders. If you build it, the oysters will come. Did they come? They did. And they came, <laughs> they came in abundance. We, it, it really blew our mind because, as I mentioned, we've just got these individuals somewhere. We don't have any remnant reefs. And, and I dived on the first construction site uh, before it was constructed, and I found one mature adult per uh, 300 metres squared. So we put the boulders in at the right time, and they came. They came. The oysters came. We didn't know if we were going to find any, but they settled in abundance and they carpeted the underside of, of these boulders. So when, when you say covered in oysters, are we talking like thousands of individuals over the yeah. coves? Okay, so like really a lot of, lot of recruitment. We're talking about 24,000 individuals per meter squared. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really wild. So... If I'm understanding this correctly, these reefs were made out of oysters upon oysters upon oysters growing on kilometer after kilometer of rock, literally creating a reef where there wouldn't have been one. It would have been only sand. Yeah, so close. It's not quite that. When the original oyster reefs were there in a the halt, they just kind of been there forever. So there weren't any rocks that the oysters needed to attach to. There was just an old oyster reef, and then the new oysters grew on top of that one, and that one, and that one. It was just oysters on top of oysters. And that's the kind of point, right? These are ecosystem engineers. It's what they do. They take sandy, boring bottoms and create reefs, and that's kind of cool. So they're literally ecosystem engineers. I can see how what they do is really valuable, and my inner conservationist is totally on board, but my inner pragmatist is thinking that going around coastlines, dropping boulders into the ocean, that's a pretty big job. You're right. It is a big job. Because the oyster reefs were destroyed, it takes a lot more work. I mean, there's literally crews with cranes on a boat dropping these giant boulders into the ocean. This ain't cheap. This ain't easy. This is really, really hard. So they're going around dropping these boulders into the ocean. But how did they make sure that the oysters would attach to the boulders? Well, they had a couple of different strategies, and one of them might come as a surprise when you think about the sensory capacity of the oyster, and it actually has to do with sound. Take a listen to this. It sounds like a crackling fireplace. 
It does. And in fact, uh, if any listeners have gone scuba diving or snorkeling near a healthy reef, and I've done this a number of times being a former marine biologist, that's the sound of a healthy reef system. You stick your head underwater and it's loud. So Dominic and his colleagues found that when you play the sounds of a healthy reef system, like literally through speakers underwater, this attracts oyster larvae to where that sound is coming from. There had been some research to show that oyster larvae would dive and settle in the presence of healthy sound as opposed to no sound. So we just delved a bit deeper and thought, well, maybe we can use that to actually bring them towards our reefs. And hey, presto, we could. And that's the research we've been focusing on over the last couple of years, where we've been actually amplifying the most attractive sounds of the sea using underwater speakers to draw baby oysters towards our reef. And the results have been pretty amazing. By putting speakers on our restorations, we had up to 17,000 more oysters settling per meter squared in the presence of our speakers than in the absence. So you, you did this kind of initial drop of these limestone boulders, right? And you weren't sure what was going to happen. You started to see recruitment. Now you're doing more research and figuring out other methods, playing sound. Um, anything else you guys are doing to kind of enhance the recruitment here? So we're actually taking what I call a, a multi-species approach to restoration. We've lost oyster reefs at the very least 1,500 kilometers in this state alone. But we've also lost thousands of hectares of seagrass as the city of Adelaide developed. You had nutrient runoff from both our farms and our urban areas. And we lost kilometers and kilometers of kelp forest. So our work now centers on restoring not just oyster reefs, but sort of seascape connectivity by utilizing these boulder reefs, which are massive infrastructure projects. We're talking about barges going out with cranes yeah. dropping thousands of tons of limestone. So we're trying to utilize them to bring back multiple systems. And we're using kelp transplants. And we're also using the hydrological shadow provided by these reefs to bring back seagrass, which used to exist in these environments. And we see that when you put boulders down, that's a lot of habitat for a lot of opportunistic species, not just oysters. So that's just one other strategy that we're focusing on. But of course, these oyster attraction strategies, although kind of cool sounding, don't change the fact that the initial step in all of this, the giant limestone boulders that the oysters need to attach to, those are costly and dropping them out of the ocean requires a lot of effort. So to kickstart reef redevelopment in more places, Dominic realized he needed to take a different strategy, one that wasn't necessarily focused on oysters per se, but rather on people. So I'm a marine ecologist, and when I first came here, I was all excited about bringing back oysters. And as soon as I walked into the first government meeting, I said on multiple government panels providing advice on the restoration space, I realized immediately that I had to get out of my ivory tower because nobody cares for the oysters themselves. It's all about the social benefits. So I have transitioned and broadened my work to work with social scientists and conservation psychologists and economists and lawyers to understand how we can, A, simplify the process for restoration. At the moment, it's a very complex legislative process that not many people can um, navigate. But what I'm really interested in is how we create more of a restoration culture. Hmm. How do we involve communities at large to get involved with restoration, to legitimize government investment, and to incentivize industries to back restoration, first and most likely through growing corporate responsibility that governments want to invest in green projects, uh, either as offsets or just for kudos with the customers. But as a longer term vision, I would like to see restoration as a normal part of coastal living and for coastal industries to support coastal living because thriving marine ecosystems support social well-being. How do we do that? Um, first of all, you make the process a little bit easier and you really incentivize community involvement in these restorations. Okay, so you have beavers building dams and creating ponds, and you have oysters building these massive reefs. These sound like success stories. 
they are success stories in the hall. But to do this in the real world is more than just a science question, right? You can't just go out and drop some boulders out off the coast. You can't just put some beavers back in the UK and... I mean, that'll result in flooding of some farmer's plot of land, right? You need support from the local community, and you need money and permits from support from the local government. And that's not easy to come by all the time. I get that, especially with all the challenges that people and governments are dealing with as we try to recover from COVID. I also found it really interesting that for Dominic, finding those historical maps helped people imagine what it could look like to restore those oyster reefs. Definitely. I really think that the history of a place or a people can be a spark for these restoration projects, but you have to find a way to get that momentum going, get that interest, and keep it going long term. Community engagement is really key to the success of these restoration projects. And I wanted to find out more about how scientists are working to actually bridge that gap between the science and the stakeholders. So I reached out to Andy Kliske. I'm Andy Kliske, originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Currently, I'm a President's Professor in Landscape um, and Community Resilience at the University of Idaho. And there I'm also the co-director for the Center for Resilient Communities. Andy has decades of experience with many long-term, large-scale restoration and conservation projects. He's worked in his native New Zealand, in rural Canada, and is now in Idaho, in the mountainous western parts of the United States. So when you're starting to think about a project like this, who are the people that you're starting to think about? Like, who are the players involved? There are multiple people, um, whether it's local community, whether it's, you know, regional and state and federal managers who have another sort of knowledge and different knowledges, hmm. you know, often very practical, pragmatic knowledge that um, for those of us that work in a university, we sometimes we can easily forget. And it's this sort of interplay between what we know is that, you know, the best science and, and often that's the best Western science. But there's also you know, tribal or indigenous knowledge and science that comes at it from a different perspective uh, that in particular really does accommodate this breadth of understanding points, the social system, the issues of policies and governance and regulations and people's attitudes and values that all come into place. That's all part of the social system. And then you know, the actual physical process. Andy's work falls in the field of social ecological systems. And he explains that thinking about conservation in terms of both social systems and ecological systems and putting them together is helping biologists and conservationists and policymakers approach their work in a different way than they have previously. It means looking at environmental issues, not just from a single sort of disciplinary point of view, not thinking of it just from the, the physical process, but thinking, well, everything happens in, in different contexts. Many things occur in a local place, in a town, in a community. And so it is looking at what are the links across those different ways of understanding things. And really, it's about thinking about people in the landscape as being intertwined and how one interacts with the other. And so when we come at it as, as scientists, looking at multiple ways of knowing and how those can be weaved. And in some ways, social ecological systems thinking, it's an age old approach mm. to things. I mean, in Western science, with the enlightenment and kind of this approach to compartmentalizing how we approach science into little, very fine, narrow, detailed aspects of study has moved us away from thinking about the whole and how things interact. But, you know, once upon a time, indigenous communities still very much focus on the whole picture, how it's interacting. And so that's what we're trying to do in taking this approach. It's like, how do all of the pieces interweave? How do we understand these interactions to best understand the issues related? But we need to understand the decision making and the governance and the politics and the policies. And how did each of those come into play so we do ask, well, you know, which communities, uh, which people, you know, benefit from this? How how do we make sure that, you know, tribal communities get some benefit? And it's not just then going to be about, you know, Native Americans as members of a particular community, but then it's also the non-human um, mm. players that come into play. How do we benefit the ecosystem as a whole, regardless of our place in it? 
Andy says that this more holistic approach allows for an exchange of knowledge between scientists and local stakeholders, and the fact that that knowledge isn't just going from one place to another, the scientists to the stakeholders, but also back again, in fact improves the science in the biggest scale of thinking about it. A recent project that we worked on in the Magic Valley of Upper Snake River Basin in southern Idaho, we had um, a group of stakeholders, we called it a stakeholder advisory group, and the research team from uh, University of Idaho, University of New Hampshire, other partners, we really changed what we did because of what we were hearing and being told by this group of, of community members, these community representatives, these stakeholders. They were telling us things that was different from what we thought based on our disciplinary knowledge and the computational model we were doing. When we presented it, we were told, well, you know, that's all very well, but you've forgotten that in, in reality, this is what might happen. It's like, oh, okay. And it can take a while for us as a scientist to recognize and understand, actually, we can't just go, okay, that's great, you know, nice, good to hear that and carry on doing the way we have always done things, but going, okay, let's actually build that into what we're doing and, and change what we're thinking. And as a result, you know, we actually sometimes do have research outcomes, which then, you know, come into play in, in you know, for example, restoration projects because we've changed something based on input from communities. Working through the lens of social ecological systems makes a lot of sense, but Andy notes that forming these partnerships and developing new perspectives can be really challenging and genuinely humbling. I think understanding what knowledge means to different people to different communities and the importance of what that knowledge is that's tied up with you know issues of, of trust and, and listening and understanding from a place that perhaps you know I might as a scientist might not be comfortable with and I think doing this sort of you know socio-environmental systems interdisciplinary transdisciplinary work means being prepared to be uncomfortable you know, whether that's being uncomfortable because you're trained as a hydrologist and you have to work with an economist and it's like, whoa, that is a different <laughs> way of thinking about things. Or yeah. because you're, you know, work in a university and you're having or wanting to work with people in a community with very real issues that come into play and, you know, that, that speak a different language and for which there are different cultural norms, that can be uncomfortable. And so I think being prepared to be uncomfortable and, and recognizing that is sort of another important kind of lesson learned um, or best practice. Is this type of thinking newer and is it proving to be more successful when we're trying to look at ecosystem scale projects? The thinking is not new, but using it within conventional science is relatively new. And, and you know, there's a body of work for the last, I'm going to say, 15 to 20 years, um, especially in the last 10 years where you see this you know, explosion of effort and work on, you know, how do we actually do this sort of work and why is it important? And I think it is important. It goes hand in hand, again, from a conventional science point of view, disciplinary science and understanding in depth about specific things is important. We, we still need that. But we also need to be able to bring this different disciplinary knowledge and then the knowledge that stakeholders, rights holders in the case of tribal nations, other experts have and look at them together. They each have something to offer. And with the issues that we're, you know, we're faced with, you know, whether they're water issues, whether they're fisheries and food issues, uh, they're interlinked. And we need to bring as much good understanding and knowledge to play as we can. We can't just rely on one particular way of thinking about it. And so interdisciplinary thinking, social ecological system approaches, I think, are coming into play a lot more. That'll do it for this week's episode. A big thank you to each and every one of the scholars we spoke to this week. Also a shout out to Doug Hendry at The Conversation Australia, who worked on the original Oyster Reef story that inspired this episode. We'll be back with another episode next Thursday. In the meantime, you can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, on Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us podcast at theconversation.com. If you like what we do, please support the podcast and the conversation more broadly. Just go to donate.theconversation.com. This episode of The Conversation Weekly was produced by Katie Flood, and it was written by Katie Flood and Dan Marino. 
Sound design was by Eloise Stevens, and our theme music is by Nita Searle. Men Marwani is our executive producer, and Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor. Alice Mason runs our social media, and Soraya Nandi does our transcripts. I'm Nihal Al-Hadi. And I am Dan Marino. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. <laughs>